Hello everybody, my name is Nick Starwind and we are back. After putting a coach to its hopeful resting place and evolving into this brand new design you see before you, we are here to bring you a brand new Starwind Zone, where we look into the lost treasures from Media's past. So soon after I finished part 3 and went to enjoy a lockdown Christmas, it was brought to my attention by my father about a particular show that I loved growing up and had totally put to the side. And, despite its history and protection away from the claws of the BBC dustbin, it still manages to have some form of missing media. And due to various reasons over the passing years, has been lost from our screens, only randomly appearing on one occasion in the 2010s before vanishing with no sign of any up to date release. Although for these reviews we normally go digging deep and throwing punches, I'm afraid it won't be as gripping in the ups and downs of a dramatic journey as our previous adventures have been, mainly due to the fact that there is no sneaky underhanded tactics by so-called fans and constant sea of lies keeping it from the public eye. So, although this has been quite a dig, it isn't as deep and as dark as before, so hopefully not too much stress for you or me. So what series am I talking about exactly? Well, once again we seem to be diving into the world of steam engines, and travel to a small railway in the top left hand corner of Wales and visit the locomotive of the Marionef Atlanticilly Rail Traction Company Limited. But as we all know him, it's Ivor the Engine. Now, before I begin this episode, I would like to personally thank Daniel Postgate, Oliver Postgate's son, and current head of Small Films for taking the time to talk to me about this subject. He's told me that Ivor the Engine is a show he cares a lot about, and wants to gain awareness about this lost media and other aspects of the show. So, let's begin. Ivor the Engine tells the story of a green tank engine in Wales, whose dream is to sing in the local choir, and with the help of his driver Jones the Steam, Dice Station and his many friends, he is given special organ pipes to make his dream come true, which expands his world further as many characters in the town gravitate towards him, such as gold miners, elephants and even dragons, making a wholesome and charming set of stories that people of many generations have enjoyed. Created in 1958, Ivor the Engine was the creation of Oliver Postgate and Peter Furman of their recently formed company after working for ITV, Small Films, who, for those who are unfamiliar, were one of the biggest contributors to children's television from the 1950s to the 1980s, with a variety of classic shows that have become a staple in British culture. Some of their shows include Bagpuss, a saggy old cloth cat who taught us about recycling items with cute songs and stories, Nog in the Nod, which told tales of brave Vikings, ice dragons, and journeys to mystical lands, and not forgetting one of the most identified shows to this day, The Clangers, which invite us to the world of whistling aliens and soup dragons in the depth of space, where every episode brings a new friend to the planet, being so popular as to get a reboot in 2015. What made their creation so unique was the homemade aesthetic that is adopted throughout their work, mainly due to low budgets which led them to creating sets from bits and bats they found around the farm, or getting their close ones to knit the bodies of their characters to put over armatures, such as with the penguins and the clangers, putting it all together in their studio they made in a shed. Either the engine's creation involved cut-out animation, where Peter Furman would draw multiple expressions and poses, to which Oliver Postgate would photograph them in a stop-motion process and replace the needed parts of the characters. You may recognise this process being later used by animators such as Terry Gilliam in Monty Python, or even more so, the first few episodes of South Park, although nowadays that particular style is generated on 3D programs to make it easier. Ivor the Engine was one of the first productions done by small films, and later would return two more times before being retired to the back of the production shed indefinitely, being released every decade or so for a new generation, although that would only be for one rendition of the series, while the other two are sadly forgotten. The first production was as I said in 1958, and in black and white, which I have dubbed as the pilot series, which premiered on ITV, before being shelved until 1966 when it was completely revamped for the sequel to the previous series, lasting until 1969. Afterwards, the series wouldn't return until 1975, where the stories from the second reincarnation would be reimagined into colour and premiered on the BBC until 1977 before being retired to the back of the production shed once more. 
With only one VHS release of the 50s version in the 90s, the only available reincarnation you can get with ease is the 1970s colour version, which is currently distributed by Universal Studios, leaving not only the first one forgotten, but the second one very much lost to the sands of time. So the main questions are, what happened to them? Where did they go? Where are they today? And as always, will we ever see them in future? Well, there's only one way to find out, it's time to enter the Starwind Zone. You're about to enter a new dimension. A dimension of lost media, lost memories, lost dreams, lost possibilities. The realm that excavates the forgotten antiques of time, with a man clearly unqualified to lead it. So grab your tickets and get comfortable, and ride the missing coach in two. So first off, let's talk about the pilot series from 1958, as although this did get a home video release, it was still just a one-off and no further releases have happened since then, so it classes as a form of lost media. The original series ran for six episodes and told the origin story of how Ivor got his whistles and joined the choir, making it a very innocent and sweet story from beginning to end, establishing one of the many recognisable icons from the small film's library. After its first run on television, it wasn't properly released until 1991 when the BBC made a limited edition VHS tape titled The First Story, which after its short run became very valuable as this is the only time audiences got to see the story because the later versions never remade those episodes, and unless you were lucky enough to get a hold of the audio tapes or storybooks, this was really the only way you could see it if you were a fan. What is rather funny about this VHS is that a lot of people who own it don't realise how hard it is to find. If you go on any shopping website, 99% of the time you will not see it listed, and most likely when that 1% happens, there will be a bidding war, while the unknowing people who just keep them shoved in their attics and propping up tables have no clue. Luckily, however, I actually have a copy of this VHS in my collection. Although it isn't an official copy, it's just the official case with a pirate copy inside. But before you jump down my throats as usual about piracy, let me explain. Back in the 90s, there was a library in my town that rented out VHSs, and the guy who was in charge of the section was very passionate about unique films and animation, especially that of British animation. And my dad was friends with this guy, and one day he asked about getting me some Eye for the Engine episodes for my birthday, and he mentioned that he had this video which was previously on the shelf, and decided to not only make a copy of that, but add another tape of episodes he had stored in his collection as well, and placing it inside its original box, which could be due to the fact that maybe after being rented out so many times, the tape was worn down and had to be preserved. So on my 6th birthday, I unwrapped this VHS and remember frequently sitting on the floor playing with my Thomas trains and watching it on repeat because of how much I loved it. Although, not realising that after this VHS ended, the new VHS began, which I didn't realise until I began digitising it, making it the gift that keeps on giving, including some very old school movie review shows, which, if I may say, makes me so grateful that you two came along, because these are just cringe, with a side order of, oh my god. Hi, I'm Daniela. I'm Chad. I'm Emily. I'm Scott. And I work in retail. I work for the government. I work at the Odeon Cinema. I enjoy swimming. I play drums for a band called The Paupers. I love spending money. I like going out with my friends and having a good time. All I really want out of life is... Sex, drugs and rock and roll. A good man singing in the bathroom. I have a phobia about... Junk food. Doctors and needles. I only came on here to see movies for free. But enough about that buffet of gah. Let's see what we have here. I think the best way to describe the original version is through the words of Oliver Postgate himself, who opens the VHS with a little introduction and setting the period it was released. Well, it's a long story. Ivor got his three big pipes a very long time ago. In fact, the films which we made to tell the story of how he got his pipes and what they were for was the very first film we ever made. And that was over 30 years ago. And that was a time when television was all black and white and grey. And life 
on television at least, was very much slower and gentler than it is today. So let us have a look at those films. Here is the first story of Ivor the Engine. So this is very much a calm and quiet set of episodes, and I mean quiet. Aside from Postgate's soothing narration, voices and his unique sound effects, the only music present is the actual theme song, written by Vernon Elliott, and the choir music. So it follows a similar tempo to many other shows during the Watch With Mother era of television, possibly in order for it to transfer over to radio without much editing needed. Each episode is 10 minutes long and has a very much slower pace with a limited set of characters compared to the later versions, establishing characters such as Jones the Steam, Die Station, Evan the Song to name a few, while at the same time giving us one-off characters only to appear in this version, such as Claude and Mr Jenkins. Which, due to limitations of Postgate's vocal range at the time, didn't really add much depth to these characters anyway, so not much of a loss compared to who we got added later on down the line. Although the story is very straightforward in terms of structure, making it very easy for children to follow, when Postgate was planning the show, one of his main inspirations for the story was based off the works of Dylan Thomas, specifically that of one of his most famous works, Under Milk Wood, which is a story about the residents of an imaginary fishing village in Wales, and I believe he has taken on this inspiration to great effect, by creating something in very much a similar vein, but at the same time being completely original, giving us this charming story. It is spring moonless night in the small town, Starless and Bible black, the cobble streets silent, and the hunched quarters and rabbits wood limping invisible down. Not very long ago, in the top left hand corner of Wales, there was a railway. It wasn't a very long railway, or a very important railway, but it was called the Marionette and Lanticilly Rail Traction Company Limited, and it was all there was. And in a shed, in a siding, the far end of the railway, there lived Ivor the Engine. These episodes are done in the same animation style as the later seasons of the show, but this time round the designs are dramatically different and very rough around the edges, due to its limitations being in black and white. But Peter Furman does an amazing job making these characters stand out from the background with its hard lines and interesting use of shading, and the slight shadow effect they create during the production process by Oliver Postgate. I love these episodes, and they are always relaxing to watch if you just want to switch off for an hour, and it is a real shame that it only got the one run on TV and one run on home media, as the only time people ever seem to see these are when there is a special small films anniversary and the BBC briefly put them out, and the last time that happened was many years ago. From a historical point of view, I believe these are very important pieces of media and should be preserved, rightly so, as an example of how an independent progresses over time, especially with how different the production values are compared to the later renditions. Although it is very hard to obtain the VHS of these episodes nowadays, Daniel Postgate has told me that if anyone wishes to view them, that he has uploaded them to the Small Films Facebook page, as there is no plans at the moment to release these on DVD, due to the distribution issues with Universal. So it's amazing of him to give people this insight into such a classic show. So I shall link that in the description below. In the meantime though, let's move on to the big boy of our mystery, the second season. So we fast forward to 1966, and the show returns to ITV, where a further 26 episodes are commissioned, continuing from where the first series ended, leading to them redesigning the whole look of the show, adding more characters and locations to expand the world that the already existing characters lived in. Characters like Idris the Dragon, the Welsh dragon who lives in a gas-powered volcano, is one of many new additions that add more depth to the show, along with new characters such as Mr Dinwiddie, the local gold miner who comes up with all sorts of crazy inventions, slowly pulling us away from the smooth under milkwood tones and entering a more fantastical world of cartoonish characters, especially with the additional voice of David Edwards joining Oliver Postgate, who remains as the narrator and the voice for Jones the Steam and others. 
This new direction is also apparent in its art style that has removed itself from its rough look, becoming more defined and detailed in the more cartoon aesthetic, and using its limitations in black and white to further pull out the characters against their backgrounds, especially Ivor, who is a lot more outlined than before. Included in this enthusiastic and colourful tone shift in storytelling structure, I had noticed in this version is Postgate's use of breaking the fourth wall every so often, like in this episode that Dan allowed me to use for the video, where Postgate asks Jones and Die if Ivor can blow the whistles for the audience. Oh look, here come Jones and Die. We'll ask Jones' team if we can hear them, shall we? Uh, 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 Mr. Jones? Excuse us, I wonder, could you ask Ivor if he'd give us a little blow of his whistle? My friends and I would rather like to hear them, if he wouldn't mind, you know. Oh no, Ivor wouldn't mind. Give us a little blow, Ivor, would you? Even though this is the only episode I have seen of this rendition, I can certainly see how its popularity grew, as it is certainly an evolution from its previous outing and certainly extends itself into that of a full-fledged children's series, no doubt getting the BBC's attention later down the line, as it has a lot more energy to it and a great diversity of characters. Sadly though, this version would be replaced by the 70s colour era of the show, which took the 26 episodes and cut them down and colourised them for the dawn of colour TV. Which is probably why this era of the series was never revisited for future showings or on home media, because it was way too similar to each other. Whereas other shows like Noggin and Nod, which had its black and white run at around the same time before getting to colourised stories in the 80s, was still able to get a limited DVD run with all the different versions on it. Unlike Nog and the Nod and the pilot series of Ivor though, these were never seen again after their initial run and put among the other reels of films inside Oliver Postgate's shed that he previously used for storing pigs, although not at the same time as the Daily Mail seems to suggest. We know this is the case, as in a 2005 documentary on small films, Postgate is seen pointing out the various reels in the shed, stating that... Look, there's 40 years of assorted tins. I have the slightest idea what's in them. One day I'm going to have to go through that lot. But not at the moment. It's, it's a burden on my conscience, this lot. It's got to go. Unfortunately, though, he never got round to doing this as he passed away in 2008, leaving them to not be properly looked into until 2010 when Daniel Postgate found them while going through all his belongings, finding not only the original 26 episodes of the series, but reels from the lesser known productions such as The Seal of Neptune and The Mermaid's Pearl. But what has happened since this discovery? as it's been pretty quiet after the Daily Mail laid claim to it 11 years ago, with the promise of a possible release in future. Well, nothing really. Aside from the other Ivor related plans, such as an Ivor the Engine live action movie, nothing else has really happened to our favourite singing tank engine. So, what's been going on? Well, thanks to Daniel Postgate, the story isn't filled with a great air of mystery and conspiracies as our favourite coach but merely just the inconveniences brought upon by other parties. The first issue was getting them digitised, because after the episodes were found, they were sent to a Birmingham-based company named Kaleidoscope, who specialised in digitising old films on celluloid, with the hopes of a DVD or online release later down the line. But after eight years of back and forth communication between Dan and them, they were all returned to him with only 18 of the 26 episodes digitised and in formats that were too complicated for a simple upload or transfer process, barring the one he uploaded himself, thus leading to it being temporarily shelved until further notice. However though, my friend, MK Instrumentalist, brought to my attention that in 2015, a community television channel in Birmingham named Big Centre TV suddenly began airing these digitised episodes randomly during the day, first only a couple and then gradually expanding it over the years until the channel was terminated. When asking Dan about this, he said that the channel had some connections to Kaleidoscope, although whether they had permission to air these episodes I couldn't confirm. The second issue that came up with the distribution of these episodes was a situation with Universal Studios, who currently own the DVD rights to small films, which created a grey area for how to approach this, 
as Universal wasn't interested in putting them on DVD, especially with the declining sales in DVDs due to streaming services, which shows like Clangers and Bagpuss are already a part of. So until these rights expire, that is again temporarily put on hold. The third and final issue that has prevented any possible independent release in the event of Dan being able to, was the uncertainty around whether the secondary company who helped produce this version had some stake in it still. Reader Fusion was a franchise holder for ITV in London and other parts of the country, and was the company that Postgate and Furman originally worked for in the beginning, before they broke off to create small films. When creating the original Iver series, however, it was with the help of Reader Fusion who distributed them onto ITV, thus possibly giving them a section of copyright ownership towards the black and white renditions. Even though the company was thought to have closed down in 1969, around the same time as the second series finished, it has come back on different occasions over the years before the name was obtained by a British journalist named Victor Louise Smith in the 90s and becoming part of his production company. So although they are no longer in existence, Dan is unsure whether they have any control over these episodes or not, and as he said, he doesn't wish to kick that hornet's nest until he knows further information about it. So at the moment, it's a case of time. But in my opinion, this is pretty good to hear as although there are few walls in place, there aren't permanent obstacles and could easily change in future, especially with how Dan still has the original episodes in his possession, showing that when the day comes, it will be pretty straightforward compared to other instances in the past where you had to travel all the way around the world just to get all the pieces together, like with Doctor Who. Now you're probably all wondering to yourselves, why haven't I obtained these episodes and thrown them out online like when I condoned the leaks of Thomas and the Magic Railroad and my involvement with the missing coach? Because clearly it should be in the same situation, right? Well, not exactly. You see, the difference between this and them is that we had to pry the photos and footage from the hands of people who didn't have any right to keep them to themselves. We have already learned that there was no legal law preventing fans from seeing that stuff in the past. But in this case, however, there actually is a wall. And if it is tampered, it can actually prevent the prospects of stuff being given to us in the future because people like Dan care a whole lot about preserving that history and showcasing it to audiences. Even with groups such as the Dragons Friendly Society, who make sure even the lesser known productions like Penguins stay accessible to people. And by having that level of respect for Oliver and Peter, it won't be lost to the sands of time, or locked away in a vault by companies who don't care for history. If anything, this video is to gain awareness of his existence and hopefully get the ball rolling, as I do plan to make a part 2 about this, with the permission of Dan, to actually look at these episodes and to promote an upcoming installation of the history of small films in the UK. But in the meantime, he has been kind enough to give us this taster of this forgotten series. If you're interested in looking into the history of small films and their productions, there are some brilliant documentaries which I shall link below, with many different places you can see episodes on YouTube, including the original six Ivor the Engine episodes that you can find on the Small Films Facebook page, and don't forget to give it a follow as well, because by doing so we can gain awareness and get this show on the road. But for the moment, that is everything I have to say on Ivor the Engine for the moment, so thank you for stopping by and I hope you enjoyed the insight I have given you. But until next time, I have been Nick Starwind, you have been my audience, and remember to like, share, subscribe, stick it on a badger, attach it to a brick, mail it to a bomb because of like a surprise, and if you can, spare some change, governor, by donating the links below. And as always, I shall see you next time.